you hear a loud explosion and you look at your window and you see a pillar of smoke, fire rising. I know that I just did something desperately wrong. The computer's out the window. Yeah. No. Everyone will be escaping via the green. That's why they have it. Dramatic things being discussed over there. Yeah. <laughs> one of those days. Yeah, I've never used this system before. What, what kind of a system is it? This. Oh, this one. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lawyer. So, yeah, you've got tasks Mark, that Mark, you're not used to. Lawyer. Oh, I'm seeing uh, this. Lawyer. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Bill? Oh, good to yeah. meet you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Now I'm uh, <laughs> double shining, and I have to go and unpack. I've got it. Every morning. Great, great. Do you want to click on people and uh, Is the SPRC meeting? Um, no, it's over there. Uh, it's second floor in the cherry room. Okay, yeah. This is the C2E2. Oh, I know. It's Monday night. I think right. this is the gentleman from the green thing. Hi, Ted. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Nice to meet you all. So, you have four people. Good. I'm uh, I'm Steven. Steven. Nice to Pretty good. Doug Snow and Boss. Yeah. I did that. Yeah. Right, and I, I I'm, uh, I'm Stephen. Yeah. So yeah, so I, yeah, I did. I did it in college. It's a uh, really great program. Yeah, we're in the third week. And yeah, you can stop sharing. Yeah, all people are seeing is. There you go. See how they can see the Yeah. Um. How many people are in the group this year? Um, uh, oh, good. All uh, over Zoom? No, actually, it's mostly Wow. Okay. Where do you guys go? Uh, meet up. to be rude, but if we could make the nine people I Yeah, that's rude. <laughs> we would all be here. I'm all for that, actually. Okay. 
Okay. Um, we have a quorum of the pictures, which, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So, let's see, not one, two, she's not here, she's not one, two, oh, no. three, four, five. Two, two, two more. Well, for, uh, uh, Jones, do we have any online yet? Ran. No. So we're talking about a quorum in person in order to okay. do the letters and the minutes. Right. Did, did Joan say anything about what being done? Joan said <coughs> that she thought there was going to be a quorum. There are two people that didn't respond, but she said they generally show up in person. She didn't identify who. Right. Yeah, there was some back and forth about people coming, but. Should we start without Jim? No, we don't have a quorum for decisions. Yeah, right? yeah. But um, that's only critical for decisions. Correct? Should we have public comment? We could. Okay. Um, Maybe we need to you know, we have a hard stop. Hello, can everyone hear me? Great. We have a number of public guests here tonight. Um, if you could just, I'm going to call out names and just tell me if you're here from the public. And if you are, can you just introduce yourself and then you'll have up to three minutes to make comments. I just want to let everybody know that we are recording and transcribing the meeting. So the first name I see is Dorothea Antonio. Sure, and hello everyone. I am, I am with the, um, I am participating in the Abraham Arlington Neighborhood College and, and had heard about this meeting and just interested in, in hearing your agenda and learning more about what you do. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Gary Shinners, uh, your name correctly. Are you also a public guest? Um, yes, I am. I'm uh, like Dorothy. I, um, I'm attending. Uh, based on the suggestion of the Arlington uh, Neighborhood College. And um, I'm also uh, a member of the Arlington Regional Master Naturalist and a Virginia Master Naturalist. And that was uh, part of the reason why I also wanted to uh, sit in on one of your meetings. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, this is the first time I'm doing this. Um, I'm actually the bureau chief trying to do something responsible tonight. Um, so pardon me if I, I don't get your identification correct, but is it Jamie Hood and are you a public guest? Hi, yes, uh, my name is Jamie Hood. I'm also with the Arlington Neighborhood College. Um, but I work at Arlington Community Foundation and I have um, a deep interest in sustainability and the environment. So I thought I would sit in. Great, welcome. And Judy Collins. Hello, I'm Judy Collins and I am an observer from the League of Women Voters, Arlington and Alexandria City. Just to, uh, just here to observe, thank you. Welcome, you remind me, I need to join the local chapter of your organization. Yeah, we'd, um, lo we'd love to have you. I would love to be had here. Um, Pamela, it just simply says Pamela, a guest. Yes, hello, um, it's Pamela Barr. I'm also Arlington Neighborhood College, very much interested in the environment, so I thought that I would um, sit in. Thank you. Great. Uh, Ruth Woolett. Hi, I'm a member of the Hi, I'm a member of the local Sierra Club, and I'm just here to observe. Welcome. And Suzanne S., like Sam, also indicated as a guest. Hi, yes, Suzanne Swink. Um, I am just here as myself. I'm an energy and environment professional, and I heard that um, you guys may be looking into building a green bank in Arlington in the future, and um, just wanted to observe because um, I'm uh, considering um, applying for one of the vacancies on C2E2. So excited to, to learn more and just hear what's on your agenda tonight. Great. Wonderful. Um, and Ted, Tiffany, 
said, would you just like to introduce yourself briefly, although I know you're going to be speaking, you're on the agenda this evening. Yeah. And thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Absolutely. Ted Tiffany, Building Decarbonization Coalition. I'm our senior technical lead and uh, hopefully be speaking uh, this, uh, this evening with uh, building decarbonization. So looking forward to, to talking with you folks. Great. And when it comes time, I want to make sure that we hear everything that you say, Ted. It was a little soft for me, your volume. Thank you. I will work on that. Thank you. Thanks so much. And we officially now have a quorum so we can move forward to the business of the agenda. And I'm going to yield the floor to Joan. Joan may want to go around and do just a introduction that counts so we can introduce ourselves to you as well. Okay, so we haven't gone around not the around about ourselves. Okay. Yeah. okay. Good I'm evening, everybody. Just had like that's one of the reasons why people don't take bus that often. <laughs> right. um, and Joe McIntyre, I'm chair of um, the Climate Change, Energy, and Environment Commission. So around this way. Sure. Uh, Rob Sandoli, Commissioner. Uh, Bill Edgar, uh, Climate Policy Officer from Arlington County. Hi, Eric Gibbs, Commissioner. Commissioner. I'm Doug Snow and Boss. I'm the new Commissioner. I'm Barbara Phillip. I'm with the uh, being one of the Arlington Uh, Stephen Galesio, uh, EM Commissioner. Carrie Thompson, uh, Commissioner and Vice Chair. Uh, Rich Dooley, County Staff on the Air Team. Richard Bride, Bureau Chief, Office of Sustainability and Environmental Management for the County. And we have two in line uh, Cindy and John. Oh, Cindy and John. Hi. I'm so sorry. How rude of me. Uh, well, we were a little bit late. Or I can speak for John, but I'm coming from another meeting. Uh, but Cindy Lewin, Commissioner, happy to be here and looking forward to introducing Ted at more, slightly more length. Uh, <clears throat> Jonathan Morgenstein, I'm Commissioner, and I was late with a meeting with my one year old having to put him in bed. <laughs> <laughs> and do we have any public comments? I, I don't think so. Everybody. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to make sure there was nobody yeah. who was going to make public comments. No. Okay. Um, Okay, so let's quickly go ahead and um, approve the minutes from the March meeting. And I, I move to approve the minutes. I second. Okay, anybody have any um, comments or changes? I know Carrie went in and made a number of them today. That we can go ahead and accept before we finish, but anybody got anything else? Uh, just a real question on. Uh, are, are we on, if we're not in there present, are, are we allowed to vote or no? Yes, yes. We are, okay. Yeah, you just have to be, we just have to have a quorum in person, but then everybody gets to participate. Okay, thank you. Okay, so no proposed changes. Um, do we vote to approve? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any? Not approved. Okay, that is there. Okay, so I will turn it over to Cindy Lewin to make the introductions of our first speaker, um, Ted Tiffany. Um, yes, sorry. One quick, I think we had a new guest. Catherine Roberts, just join us. Catherine. From the public. Catherine, if you're here, can you introduce yourself? And as a public guest, you have up to three minutes for comment. If you wish. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm not here to comment. I'm just here to watch. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm very, very pleased that Ted Tiffany is here tonight with us. Ted is, as you said, the senior technical lead for the Building Decarbonization Coalition. And as you might expect, the Building Decarbonization Coalition spends its time trying to figure out how to decarbonize buildings, which coincidentally is exactly what we spend our time doing. So we got referred to uh, Ted's organization when I was working on the Americana, the SPRC, and Ted was kind enough, and that's a JBG Smith project, and Ted was kind enough to meet with them and also, it looks like there's a delay. I, can you guys hear me? It's good. Yes. It's, yes. Good. it's good. Okay. Um, so it was, uh, he was kind enough to, 
speak with JBG Smith. They were kind enough to spend their time. As you know, they still went forward. They approved at the county board this Saturday um, with still some fossil fuels in their systems. But we run into a lot of issues with people saying it's just not feasible or it's not feasible, as Demetra would point out, it's not feasible in these particular circumstances. And, you know, Ted is based in California, different rules may apply different opportunities, but uh, hearing hearing what is technically feasible, hearing what you're seeing in the landscape, hearing how we can help developers find their way, which you did, you pointed them out to some systems, showed them how there'd be synergies between their non-fossil fuel HVAC and their fossil fuel, if they would change away from their fossil fuel hot water. So with, we're so appreciative that you've spent time on this with us and are on this journey, briefly on this journey anyway. So with that, we would love to hear, and I know that you're gonna speak relatively briefly and then are open for questions, so. Hey, Ted, do you mind if I do just a, a quick overview and ask you a question to start it off with? So Please, we're in right California. Ahead. Santa Rosa, California, and if you guys have heard it, we've been in the national news uh, the last five years for battling fires on three yes. different sides. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I know. I know Santa Rosa well. I worked six years in that what is formerly known as the AVAC region. <laughs> and this year we've had uh, almost yeah. three months of straight floods. Uh, what the heck was that? Thirteen atmospheric rivers. Good God. Um, let me yeah. just give you just a little bit of background, I, not to change any of your, but just to let you know what's happening here. There's no home rule in Arlington and uh, Virginia, so we're bound by the state um, building code, which could be a little bit more progressive to be diplomatic. Um, and when you go through, I'm curious if you have time to update us on what happened with uh, Berkeley's building code, because I. I read, what was it, late last week that the Ninth Circuit, I think, overturned the, the mandatory electrification. I just saw this headline very quickly. So I wondered if you could talk about that too, because I found it very difficult to believe. But Yeah, it's it's been an interesting week. Um, we can start there if you want. Um, no, 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 I, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've, we've been fielding questions all week. Um, and, and really what, uh, I have today is just a short presentation. Uh, we can take it loosely about building technologies and the types of scale uh, or electrification. Um, but, you know, we can make it really informal and talk about some of these issues here that have popped up with the Ninth Circuit ruling. Um, and where we're going with code and policy is another application because we've been doing that uh, really nationwide on national scale with IECC codes and ASHRAE standards. Um, but let's, let's but, do both. Let's start with a, your brief presentation. Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay, Several of us that. sit on commission, uh, committees to review new buildings coming into the county, so learning more will be really helpful. Yeah. Okay, so I'll invite you guys to just uh, stop me uh, when you're ready. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah. 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 Okay, <clears throat> so um, this is really going to be centered around um, uh, commercial buildings, really. Um, we have a a lot of work in the residential scale, and that's anywhere from single family homes up to high rise residential buildings. And, you know, my background, I just uh, sold my engineering firm of 15 years. So we've been designing anything from houses to hospitals, really complex buildings. So that's my background. And I was actually volunteering for BDC for a long time, working on code and policy uplifts and educational uplifts. And that organizational um, arrangement that the BDC has is really just to uplift building decarbonization. And that's everything from the OEMs trying to build uh, technology to bring to market, but design practice with engineers and giving the owners uh, language around decarbonization and then working on the policy levers. So BDC is really trying to coordinate the whole effort to make sure that we're successful on building electrification. Um, and we started to really just to work on the the whys of why we're doing this. Um, we have to get off of our fossil fuel systems and onto clean renewable power. And the business case exists for that um, in every part of the country right now. Cost resiliency, we have all seen this last season, how very um, vulnerable we all are to natural gas um, pricing and the infrastructure increases in cost. 
um, we're at that point in time where our aging infrastructure is something we need to pay for and reinvest in. So um, we've got regulatory changes um, with the financial reportings and the disclosure coming up. Um, we've got a lot of health and equity issues uh, that we're facing as well. So all these are really driving the why. Um, you know, I'll quickly go through these reasons. I think everybody in the room really knows why we're going down this path. Um, the climate resiliency, I mean, we're facing it um, in different areas in the Midwest. We're dealing with tornadoes. You know, the, the Gulf is facing with uh, storm surges and hurricanes. You know, I'm on the West Coast dealing with a lot of flood damage. But uh, we're all increasingly uh, aware of the indoor air quality and the outdoor air quality issues that we're facing. Um, and the, in this transition where we've got to get off of our fossil fuel system and rebuild the electrical system, it is really about jobs. Um, everything we can do to rebuild our infrastructure is keeping jobs local. And I'll give you a quick picture of what the cost resiliency is. This is the business case. I've always got to have the business case for electrification. And this variability in anybody's business playbook is too much to handle, right? We all want to have the stability of electrical prices. This is the US electrical prices on average, very steady. And even in California, where we've got a really expensive electrical climate, it's pretty consistent in our rise. So that's what businesses like Target and Walmart, they're the low cost leaders because they look for these opportunities to stabilize any risk. Um, I'm gonna go through these this is more about uh, making a plan for decarbonization for existing buildings. I do a lot of existing building and, and portfolio discussions. Um, one of those is higher education and higher education is really deep on planning for decarbonization, doing the assessment for their decarbonization master plans. And I'll encourage you to look to those higher ed thermal energy networks for, for what they're doing in decarbonization. But really it's about heat pumps. And there's every scale of heat pump uh, that we can imagine on the market right now and more coming to market. Um, you know, Panama and I were just at the uh, AHR conference, which is the Advanced Heating and Refrigeration Institute uh, conference, and the amount of heat pumps on every scale we never could have imagined uh, two or three years ago. The manufacturers are responding with technology and what was been on the market is being reapplied for electrification. Um, from simple domestic hot water units in our homes, what we use on schools and small uh, HVAC buildings uh, or small commercial buildings into multifamily apartment heat pumps. The integrated heat pumps are becoming more available than I've ever seen. Package rooftop units commonly available now. And we're talking about large scale heat pumps in air source central heat pump plants and water cooled systems. These are traditionally what we used to use for building cooling. Um, they do have and are still applying these large heat recovery chiller applications and networking them um, with geothermal systems. So one of the resources I like to point to is what NREL has been doing, the National Re Renewable Energy Lab on thermal energy district planning. So these are the conversions from this analogy of the first G, the first G system being steam and high temperature water loops into what we're calling 5G now, those low temperature loops that are provided with heat pump applications and heat recovery applications, both on geothermal, but condenser water loops and renewable district plants. So this is a great resource. NREL is all on top of this and there's a ton of examples of this. This is just one that we're looking at these thermal energy network conversions from the natural gas systems to network geothermal and condenser water loops. We can do city scale plants that really use the same kind of concept of distributing natural gas, but in this sense, we're distributing geothermal to have access for every building to connect to. And that's more of a municipal scale application and these, these plants, these are just the examples that NREL had. Uh, if you go into that uh, master planning report, these are case studies that you can look at on different scales. And some of these are neighborhood scales, some of these are higher education scale campuses, but this can be done on the city scale. Um, and so they have some detailed applications. So this is in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's a geothermal application for 415,000 square feet of development over 122 acres. These are large scale electrified projects. 
New York's undergoing a bunch of these thermal energy network pilots right now, testing these non-fossil fuel plants. So these are the private thermal networks and the utilities are now um, in negotiations to implement their own um, commercial and thermal scale networks. So a lot of happening in your, your uh, neighborhood over there. Um, commercial kitchens, we can absolutely commercial uh, electrify commercial kitchens across the board. The technology is there, it's consumer awareness. And that's uh, a lot of what BDC is doing is embracing these celebrity chefs like Martin Yan of Yan Can Cook, uh, cooking on induction walks. And in San Francisco, our Asian community is really intrigued on, on induction walks and the power and safety of that. So. We definitely have that ability to electrify commercial kitchens um, and you know, places like Microsoft are already converting their entire campuses over to all electric yeah, without and really impacting their, their uh, menu offering, same great food. And so uh, we have resources for this. And in the building decarbonization practice guide, we give guidance on commercial kitchens, uh, multifamily, um, construction, which is unique, multifamily, hotel, motel, um, large building campus scales, uh, residential guidance, all within this guide. So just want to make sure that you guys know there are resources out for education um, and they're ever increasing. Um, we have a host of our, our colleagues and I used to, one of my engineering practice, call them competitors. Um, I haven't really seen any of my would-be competitors back in the day not collaborating on decarbonization policy and educational development right now. Um, it's been really heartening to see folks like EHDD, um, our folks in Ecotope, share their build, big building expertise and walking us through the engineering challenges they faced and the solutions they delivered. Um, it's a huge message to have these large-scale buildings show how they went all electric and how they did it cost effectively and the challenges they did that uh, knowledge sharing is going to be key to the success for this um, mr rumsey from point energy has just been sharing his technical expertise on the west coast and throughout um, so there's a lot of our our collaborators that are, are have these resources for you um, but education is a key and i just wanted to highlight a couple of the things that bdc does um, Plug-in water heaters. We've helped develop this with one of the manufacturers. So this is us uh, with Kevin Clark from Ream. When they brought their product to market, we gave them a platform to share how they got that thing to market and how it applies in the marketplace. Tomorrow, um, if you guys want to register for it, uh, we have a national policy call about uh, Maine and how they became the electrification leader. Um, great thing to do. So we have our blog posts, we have our regular events we have our policy calls um, and we do, we have those on different scales. We have them from um, private cities that just want to talk about, you know, regional strategy or uh, state level, what's happening in, you know, IACC coming up, you know, how are we going to apply those appendices that are in vote? Um, but uh, we'll also do those as open-ended calls. So, but that's really our role at the BDC, uh, streamlining codes and standards advocating for the tax incentives. So we're doing a lot of, we have a white paper out, uh, really the, the best strategies for implementing that IRA money for states and policy developers, um, some guidance there. And then just really just coordinating all of this and making sure that all the stakeholders are at the table, really highlighting their issues um, and coming to some really strong agreements. And, and that's what we really enjoy for facilitating, so. And uh, I'll leave it there. I have my contact, but um, you know we can take this discussion however you want. We can talk about uh, the Berkeley ruling and what that means, or questions about technologies. I will let you guys uh, pick your path. It's a choose your own adventure. I'm going to go ahead uh, again. My name is Gary. I'm wondering, has BDC worked much in Virginia, uh, including with some of the challenges? Uh, I can see that Cindy shaking. Possibly know um, with some of our challenges with uh, Dillon Rural State. Um, we see a number of the new commercial buildings, uh, tall commercial buildings coming in, sometimes with hybrid um, heat pumps with some gas for backup generators. 
I, I feel that potentially it's still that older mindset that it might be necessary for winters. Um, you know, how do we persuade them that they really don't need that? And um, those who are building taller buildings are saying that it's not possible to electrify uh, hot water systems uh, after a certain number of floors. And, you know, we know that's not necessarily true. It may just require some workarounds. Any thoughts about those things? Yeah, I think, you know, part of the conversation Cindy and I had was just getting educational resources into the hands of those designers that may have not uh, encountered it before and really get them to leapfrog that learning curve. Um, we're seeing that over and over again, that, that answer about um, domestic hot water not being able to do it in a high rise. So we've got uh, a couple of our partners are working on a presentation right there to really go through, uh, Ecotope is one of those partners. Uh, their lessons learned on doing that in a couple of their high rises and the technologies they've applied. Um, so th those resources are out there, that educational uh, sharing. Uh, we need to find a way to better facilitate that and, and through the design community. But part of that can be enabled by you uh, in those discussions of like, yeah, we do have a couple of examples of that. Let's get you in touch with the designers that worked on that um, and get that knowledge into, into the sphere. Uh, that's part of the, the effort that's going on on ASHRAE right now, which is the uh, engineering society they're putting out those design guidance right now. Those are in development. So that's been missing component in the market. But um, before we have that uh, design guide in place, you know, we've got that knowledge share and that ability to do that. Thanks. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't answer your policy question in Virginia. I haven't been actively uh, working in Virginia. And, you know, if there's an opportunity to help you guys uh, develop uh, good policy around this, we'll, we'll lean in. That's great to hear. Hi, Ted. Uh, big fan of the BDC here. Love what you and Pamela and the team are doing. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, speak to your outreach to municipalities. And uh, I believe you have like a mayoral coalition. Um, and can you just speak to that? Um, obviously, we're um, advisors to a county board and would love to know how you're approaching that audience. Uh, from the standpoint of the BDC? Yeah, I mean, my, my role really right now is working on California policy, and that's been our, our push this last week. So um, it's come in two forms uh, this week specifically. Um, one, getting all of our, our regional partners together to talk about the decision and what the strategies are for the Berkeley decision in specifics. And that was a closed network group of, you know, city actors, what's the interim policy and things like that. Uh, we also did some public outreach and public meetings about, you know, the decision and what it means for others that may be adopting policy um, or were considering policy and the implications of that. Um, so we work on our we work with our partners very closely on what on what their needs are. So it could be, you know, a legal opinion. It could be, um, you know, just what we see from other cities in action. Um, and if we're if we have a trusted partner and we say we can you know, share what a city's doing. We can share that with a number of other cities that may be considering another policy like that. So that's really how we we work is is just very closely and in a trusted manner. Uh, just, can, you, can I just pose a quick follow up? Do you have like a, a municipality best practices guidebook at the PDC? So we do have our, our compass, it's called, on our website that has example policies throughout the country. Um, so layering of um, either IECC language for electrification policy, um, and it has those various strategies. Our, our policy tracker has uh, the list of all of the other local jurisdictions that have adopted some kind of electrification policy and what their strategy and their code language is and, and points to those specific resources uh, so that you can look at what other cities are doing so that you're not reinventing the wheel or you can ask that city hey how did you implement this you know i like that specific language is that something that you know you guys feel comfortable with um how is how is your local uh jurisdiction responding that you can ask those kind of questions of the other other jurisdictions so that that's kind of a, a good educational uplift but um, you know, each jurisdiction is different. Thank you. 
A couple of things that come up repeatedly in, you know, kind of reasons why developers <clears throat> can't, you know, do all electric is one is, is actually space issues. Kind of they, they seem to think that designing for especially centralized hot water, heat pump hot water system requires different and more spaces. And, and similar, I think, at least it was, is with the VRF systems, then when you went, went below a certain number of floors, you had to design essentially two separate systems that seem to be, you know, are, are those things changing now or in, and how do you actually get beyond that? Because I think, I'm sure they're mostly coming through with starting with a, a standard plan that they work with and then they tailor it. And, and it's, it's based on making the same amount of space available in the same places for these systems. So, you know, how do you get the developers to start thinking differently about that? And is it actually really a, a, as, as big of an issue as, as they're making claim for? Um, it really becomes a very technical discussion in these high rise buildings because the, the separation of the towers really occurs with any type of mechanical system. Um, and you have to design around that. I think where a lot of projects are challenged right now is they're some way further in design and they're pivoting to do electrification sources. And then that does impact the space types um, and equipment choices. But designing from the first you know, schematic design for electrification, you're planning those spaces out that makes the job a whole lot easier. Uh, we're seeing a lot of projects that are coming in late in the day 50% construction drawings or 90%, and then looking at the electrification policies and saying, well, it's impossible to comply. Um, <clears throat> and late in the design challenges, you have to make some very tough decisions. And space is one of those big ones. Um, but if you plan for it in the beginning, it shouldn't be a challenge uh, really in thoughtful planning. Um, and some of that is not understanding the technologies and the balance between thermal storage for domestic hot water and the actual heat pumps themselves and understanding the technology. Um, but it's a deep engineering discussion that you bring educational resources to a deep educational and getting the right people in the room to have that discussion about what's appropriate, what technologies they've considered, what the issues they are facing and brainstorm about what the solutions are. And that's one of the challenges we're seeing right now is getting that deep technical expertise into the designer's hands in a trusted way that allows them to have that discussion without being confrontational. And some jurisdictions have hired um, what I like to call a peer review uh, board or a peer review group that can come in and is a trusted resource uh, for organizations. So uh, we have a couple of community choice aggregators that had facilitated a list of, you know, um, qualified engineers that can be that outside resource for the design teams if they have a, um, a permit question or an electrification strategy question. Uh, those resources are out there. But that that is one of the challenges we're seeing is trying to marry those those resources to the design teams. Now, is that something municipalities could actually facilitate in terms of how they engage developers and trying to engage them early and often? Yep. Yep. So just as a case study or example, Ted, when you spoke to JBG Smith, who's one of the better developers who has invested in research and is striving for carbon neutrality in their nationwide portfolio, were those, is that the kind of conversation you were having? I mean, I gather they were open, yeah. but what, you know, they, they were sort of stumped. Yeah, so I'll give you one example. In, in my past life, owning the engineering firm, we had three different contracts with a couple of different cities. And we were on a team of five different engineering firms that were supported on an hourly not to exceed basis for a particular project review. And we'd go in and do a peer review early on you know, early schematic designs um, and help them see the technology, how it's applied, what the ordinance is expecting. And these were in areas that already had electrification ordinances um, in hand. And then we helped them through that first peer review and then a final uh, peer review right before uh, permit 
submission to make sure that they had the right applications that would uh, likely get passed through permit review. That's one strategy. Hey, Ted, it's Tavitra. Could I ask you a brief question? Um, yep. <clears throat> set it up. Let me try and be succinct. Um, because we don't have local rule, we can't adopt here an electrification ordinance. So for a little over 20 years, Arlington County has had an incentive program for bonus density in return for exercising basically reach code design standards. So we've gone through around eight iterations of that, and it's always been based on lean and kind of going up, 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 up. We found that lean, particularly in the energy space, is not really delivering as advertised. So we're looking at FIOS. We've been working for the past six months on just framing the kind of very dramatic update to that. But we sat down, and part of our problem is just what you mentioned, is that by the time we get to site plan review, the plans are far enough along between 30 and 60%. And nobody's going to go back and spend the time and the money to kind of start over from zero, number one. And number two, even for sophisticated developers, the technology and the strategies are very new to them. So as part of our framework, we built in for six months prior to the live date of the updated ordinance, we're going to have six months of really outreach to architects, developers, builders, everyone, and really do that education. So if you have information, is it on your website or do you have other resources that you can point us to? Because that is going to be intensive and we really think that's going to be possibly a game changer. And the only other question is, when you're talking about geothermal, have you dealt with any very, very small, dense, densely developed jurisdictions such as Arlington? because we've got a lot of other conflicting infrastructure already underground. Yeah, and so direct geothermal, uh, let's see, geothermal ground source heat pump applications can come in a couple of different flavors. Um, and that resource underground can be the sewer wastewater. It could be um, piping that's adjacent to that. Coordinating that in a city, um, what I'm seeing right now is that opportunity for failing infrastructure that you need to replace anyways, those coordinating mm -hmm. um, projects that could be done where you've got to do new water lines, new sewer lines, and perhaps failing gas lines. That's a huge opportunity to pair those with a wastewater a geothermal tide system so that a piping, once that trench is open, you can do all that work together. That optimizes costs those kind of things that we're seeing. Um, but yeah, if you're trying to retrofit a particular building without doing any of that other work and having that deep underground coordination issue, direct geothermal, uh, geothermal heat pump piping and boring is gonna be really challenging there. So those are the opportunities for air source heat pumps and other water source applications that can be applied. Great, thank you. Now, one thing we're- Can I, can I follow up on that, please? Yeah, go ahead. So, um, Jonathan Morgenstein, sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but um, I actually happen to work at NREL, and um, one of the one of the projects that we've been working on, not for NYSERDA, but for the city government of, of New York, is um, doing feasibility studies for district ground source heating and cooling, and um, I, you know, I. I, I'm not personally familiar with all the the uh, you know the specific pilots that that you had in your in your um, in your slide, but I, I noticed there were a number of projects specifically in in the city, and uh, obviously you don't get more dense in the United States than, than New York City, um, so I, I'm I'm just curious, uh, is there given given Demetra's you know, very reasonable question because uh, intuitively, right? If you're if if you're putting a building over a a metro line, then right, like like, like you're not necessarily going to expect that you're going to be able to to use ground source uh, heating or cooling. But would would you be able to talk to an an example of 
something like that in New York City, given all those uh, projects that you listed. But I, I and and but also correct me if I'm wrong. Those weren't your projects, right? You weren't personally. No, no, those, okay. those are examples. I, yeah, and, yeah, and and those, the the private thermal networks uh, are, are are in development right now, and then those public applications are are still being uh, developed, and they are going to be pilot projects to see which thermal energy networks are appropriate for which, which neighborhood. In most cases, geothermal won't be the right thermal network, but it could be. You know, city of Vancouver, they have a complete district thermal plant that's running on biogas as a solution for their thermal network. And that's coming off their wastewater treatment plant. They're doing heat recovery off their wastewater that's coming back to the central plant at that central location. And the only thing they're changing is the the source of the energy at the district plant. The piping is staying remaining. So that's a another application, but really either taking partial load off with heat pump applications in those thermal networks and keeping those booster plants at the temperatures that you need. The challenge in, in a lot of these cities is uh, the buildings based on their historic design and the temperatures at which they're running, that could be a different need at the different buildings that are right adjacent in the same parcel based on the engineering. So that is gonna be the challenge for cities going forward is that deep engineering on each building and then connecting to the district plant. And that's the, that's what these pilots are hoping to reveal. And um, there's gonna be a lot of educational resources that come out of those pilot applications. But isn't it also maybe a, a surprise benefit if two buildings need different things because then you can draw heat from one and throw it into the other and vice versa and, and, and therefore Actually, it could be a good thing if two buildings next to each other need completely different uh, resources at different times. Right, right. You have a data center and a and a hotel that needs hot water right next to each other, right? That's a symbiotic relationship, right? So, yeah. Just quickly, and maybe then we can circle back and talk about Berkeley. Uh, but one of the other impediments we run into when we bring up the electrification topic at reviews of new commercial buildings coming into Arlington is uh, they look into it, they look at the uh, the load, they have a discussion with the utility, and the answer is there's insufficient load to go electric for all of our systems, and the conversation stops there. How do you coach us, the uh, Arlington County, to encourage a larger conversation with our utility to, to up the loads and make it possible, because that's where we're heading, and it needs to happen. Yeah, and, and that's a challenging discussion. We've got a lot of different regulatory bodies that are introducing this topic for the first time. Um, you know, what does an electrification impact look on uh, a fairly historic electric grid in that region? Um, and, you know, we're, we're partnering with a couple of our utilities on the West Coast to have that facilitated discussion. Um, getting vision on the grid of what is an impacted zone Right, where can't we really electrify without doing a huge infrastructure upgrades? So our particular utility right now is overlaying for the first time their natural gas network and their electric network on the same planning scale program. That shows them where they're going to plan to do electrification or um, investments in natural gas piping in the next 10 years, and now has the tool to evaluate can we not do that underground piping network for the gas utility and then put that money into the electrical infrastructure upgrade? Um, that is a single utility that provides both. Uh, that conversation was a little bit more difficult when you've got one electric utility and one gas utility. They're completely different silos. And that is a regional difference and regulatory difference from every state and region and even some municipals that have their own power systems. So um, it starts with a, a conversation and a brainstorming, getting them to the table and saying, look, this is a barrier. Um, we need to have solutions and we need to have everybody at the table. What does that look like for you? What do we do to facilitate that early vision in a project of what could that electrical impact mean on a project? and what are the uh, ways to speed up that electrical infrastructure upgrade without now, costs? 
Yeah, if you're adding in geothermal as part of those discussions, does it almost make geothermal more attractive because of the energy efficiencies you get out of geothermal that you might be able to reduce lo electric load? Yeah, Just I... <laughs> Whether even, or not when you start to add those things together. I've even had this discussion with the, the building designers that started with, you know, electric resistance boilers and showed a huge load to the utility that they needed, but didn't do the thought exercise of, okay, what if we do heat pumps that cuts it in a third? What if we do air source recovery that'll get another 10% down on that load that might not trigger that electrification upgrade at the panel or distribution level? Um, for projects. So we're actively having that discussion of what is that um, non-upgrade alternative look like in the design? Um, what's the threshold? And that's the utility that needs to say that. What's that threshold that you need to stay under to make sure that electrification project comes in? And I will say nine out of 10 times we've gone to the utility we're talking about the electrification of vehicle charging stations that are the bigger impact on the building, not really the decarbonization or electrification of the buildings. Bob had a question. Yeah, well, one quick comment first and a question. First, thanks. This is a great conversation. I, I saw you flash through your slides quickly. You had one conference up there. Just, um, you know, I'm sure you're aware that uh, once every uh, three years, the heat pump, uh, the International Energy Agency has a heat pump conference happens to be in Chicago next month and maybe a good place to uh, send our developers to see the art of the possible and get it from others. Uh, as you said, it's a great way to, um, to educate them without feeling the pressure. Uh, so that the art of the possible can be uh, conveyed to them with this, at this conference in Chicago next month. Um, question to, to towards the end, you mentioned that you're also working on strategies to uh, um, take advantage of the uh, uh, IRA. Um, Wondering uh, what you're doing there specifically and for whom, uh, given all, all the, the tax credits and funded programs coming out of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, so um, I will try to get this if I can uh, during our discussion here and put it in the chat. Um, the IRA white paper we developed uh, really just gives lessons learned on past projects and how to implement the IRA funding in a useful strategy. It doesn't really tell each state what to do, but it's kind of a lessons learned and, and, and best best bang for your buck uh, <laughs> in, in directing that IRA funding. Um, so that's what we traditionally do <clears throat> is provide really educated guidance uh, for policymakers to use as um, in, in their development of policies and strategies for may it be a local reach code or, or it be an incentive program. So I'll, I'll try to get grab that and put it in the chat. Uh, but if you search uh, building decarbonization IRA white paper, it should come up the first thing on Google. Thank you. Maybe. Real quick, I'm sorry. Ted, about the utility, I'm assuming you were talking about PG&E. Are they voluntarily becoming more transparent about what their grid amplification or capacity amplification plans are? Or is the CPUC forcing that at you? Uh, so the PG&E specifically is in their own pilot projects right now, um, and they have a single entity right now that they're working with. It's actually um, CSU Monterey Bay. Uh, they're electrifying an entire swath of that campus as it was scheduled to be upgraded for natural gas, and it's a, a key thermal um, hydraulic point in their gas system that they need to electrify to start backing off that part of the gas system. And so they're using that as a pilot and understanding what the costs are to electrifying all of the student and faculty housing in that section and going through those issues of uh, obligation to serve um, the uh, hydraulic capacity and how that happens in the phasing of that, you know, their electric engineers and um, line workers coming in and the timing for pulling that back off the gas system. So that pilot is gonna reveal a lot for that particular utility, but they're looking to expand those areas where they're they're spending money. Uh, they plan to spend money upgrading those gas lines where they can, you know, they, they see the writing on the wall. They don't wanna to have to maintain that gas system 
um, for the period that rarely they're going to be ending the service of gas in, in their region. So that that investment that's going in the, in the ground, they, they know they're not going to get their full return on. Yeah, I think so. Maybe one minute or less on the Berkeley yeah, decision, and then we'll, <laughs> we'll change the All short right. Berkeley just decision. Just more implications for broader. Yeah. Uh, so the Berkeley decision right now is in the ninth uh, district, um, and that's really you know California Western states, um, and that decision is immediately impacting that area. Uh, they have not issued a stay um, or any um, restrictions on Berkeley right now, but every indication the the next step in the court process will uh, likely um, force Berkeley to take a different strategy on their their gas ban. Um, the ruling is pretty wide in its interpretation, and there's going to be some uh, long process of adjudicating that out. Um, so right now, there's a couple of things that are unknown, and there was some wide interpretation in there that needs to be clarified. So um, right now, uh, we've got a lot of local jurisdictions that are considering their own uh, legal capacity to carry on their particular ordinances and, and evaluating their risk. But right now, not a lot of folks are, are rescinding their policy. Uh, and if they are, they're putting their enforcement on pause, awaiting the um, Berkeley adjudication to, to play out. Um, and there's a lot up for consideration. So uh, BDC is working on a legal opinion based on that. Uh, ruling and what the the paths are for local jurisdictions uh, in the coming weeks, uh, but that's going to take some time. And the final answer is is only going to come out of the resolution of the court case. Thank you very much, and thank you for for coming. And this has been very useful for us. Appreciate the, the background resources. Well, I appreciate. I appreciate the invite, and uh, if there's anything we can do uh, for you guys in your advancements of uh, if you want to send it, let us know. I'll make sure it gets. Yeah, there. absolutely. Yeah, Cindy, Cindy will have a copy of it. Great. Thank you, thank you so much, Ted. This was so informative and so you're so knowledgeable. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Try to do my best. <laughs> your evening. Appreciate y'all. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Too. Thank you, Ted. Okay, and now we get to turn and uh, have a discussion with Bill Egger, our newly appointed um, climate officer that we worked for a couple of years to, to kind of get. And hopefully he's happy that he's got a second position <laughs> with the new budget. Um, but we're anxious to hear what you've learned in your fire hose of <laughs> the last few months and what you're thinking about going forward. Awesome. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, Bill Egger uh, recently joined the county as policy officer position uh, in the county manager's office and I just want to thank you all for inviting me here tonight to uh, meet you all. Uh, I know our time uh, will be spent closely over the coming years um, uh, with not only myself but Demetria, the, uh, the air team and many throughout the county. So this is not an individual process or, or individual uh, effort. This is a really collaborative work, uh, long-standing collaborative work and I'm just joining to continue to take that forward with the, the county as a whole. Um, it's going to do three things. I think, if anything, uh, kind of address three things tonight, one of which just offer a little bit of introduction to me, uh, just give you a little bit of where I come from, uh, who I am, and where I you know, come to the county with uh, experience and background. Two, just give you a little insight into where I'm currently at with regards to my work and understanding the county, the community writ large, and you know, understanding uh, the, the needs and, and the Kind of priorities. And then third, really open up as an opportunity for hearing from you all your priorities and perspectives and use that as time to really hear and listen uh, and you understand here and on why your all's perspectives, uh, particularly since you're uh, strong advocates for the creation of this position. So uh, that, that stands as my agenda. Happy to kind of uh, add anything else. Um, I will say very, very clearly up front, I am still learning the organization. I'm still learning the issues. And so insofar as deep understanding of policy questions at this point in time, I really have to defer to my partners throughout the organization, including Demetra and others, uh, just to be fair to kind of where I'm at within my learning process. So 
I'm happy to take in questions, but I may have to defer those to others throughout the county. Um, just as a quick way of uh, background introduction, uh, I come to the county after having spent a little over 13 years with the city of Alexandria, our peer uh, jurisdiction to the southeast here. Uh, in that um, in that tenure with Alexandria, started their climate action program and built it up over the course of, of those 13 years. Um, had the opportunity and privilege to serve that community, uh, everything from working on our organizational energy efficiency and the decarbonization work, building transportation, et cetera, and then working at the planning, uh, green building, uh, policy, regulatory, and broader uh, kind of adaptation questions uh, facing the city of Alexandria. Before that, I worked for the city of Cleveland, worked for the mayor there, was uh, one of the principals for the build, building their climate action program as part of their office of sustainability. Spent a few of the years uh, doing that work um, early in the aughts as uh, municipalities began to build um, their own sustainability offices, was, was privileged to serve that community. And then before that, I uh, had spent some time working in the industrial decarbonization, the building energy efficiency, I'm sorry, the international, um, I guess, international renewable energy and uh, rural electrification kind of world. So I've had the privilege to do a lot of different things over the course of my life, uh, still continuing to learn and uh, build my understanding of this world and going to serve our public uh, right now in the, you know, in the local government and local community capacity. So uh, that's been my experience. Uh, my official training, uh, multidisciplinary engineer. I've uh, also done a lot of other things, you know, public policy, urban planning, economics, geology, just a bunch of kind of ways to build out my understanding of the world. So I come at things from a more systems oriented approach and try to bring um, kind of knowledge from other disciplines and domains to kind of broaden out my understanding of how to focus on problem solving and finding solutions. So. Uh, happy to go into the detail, but that's really uh, just kind of more formality than a, well, I, you know, necessarily bring all that to bear um, on a day to day basis. So uh, just to give you a little context for where I'm at, I've been here a uh, handful of weeks. I think it's now going on five ish. Don't really know anymore, but um, have been really scouring uh, the organization, meeting with our uh, agency leads, our uh, divisional leads, you know, getting to kind of peel back the onion, so to speak. I'm learning about the various agencies um, in, in Arlington. In many ways, you know, I've spent a long time in local government, so I understand the generalities, kind of the fundamentals of local government, but each organization is slightly different, different organization, different ways of approaching problem solving, collaboration, decision making, and trying to understand those processes from Arlington's, Arlington's perspective. Spent a lot of time during the budget process as a recent, listening into agencies articulate their priorities, where were they investing resources, both in long-term projects, but also in day-to-day -day problem solving on behalf of the community and just understanding that landscape. And then I continue to meet with um, our agencies um, across the board. For example, this week I'm meeting with community uh, planning and, and housing and development, learning more and more about those, uh, their organizations meeting with DES in a few weeks to, to meet all of the senior staff, working with AIR and OSM to better understand their work. I think one of the things that's very clear is this is a new organization, new office, new position. I have had both the privilege and the challenge of creating something that is a value add to the county that doesn't duplicate, doesn't replicate, doesn't interfere with what progress has already been made. It's very clear that I think you all know and are should be proud of that Arlington stands as a leader in the region and wants to maintain that and continue to be a leader and working to understand how this position in the county manager's office can add value and to take you know, additional resources to bear on our broader community climate action work. So that's where I stand. And so as part of all of this, meeting agency heads, but also meeting with members of the community, Joan and I had a little bit of coffee and had the opportunity to talk about priorities, meeting with many organizations, just hearing what are the priorities, learning, you know, utilizing, listening really well to understand what does this office actually look like? What does it do and how does it support the broader community's goals? So that's kind of where I'm at uh, in this process. Meeting with C2E2 tonight with you all, uh, meeting with many commissions coming up here in the next couple of weeks and throughout June, um, I've got, I can't even tell you what's on the docket, but a number of them. 
again, to meet with our, our community stakeholders to better understand different priorities that come about all related to, to climate action. And it's not just your normal environmental organizations spreading out to meet with the Economic Development Commission, meeting with our mental health commissions to understand how climate has intersection with that, but which is all what the county does. Now, it's not to say that that doesn't already occur, it's just understanding where uh, there's intersection amongst many commissions. And so that's where our work is currently focused. Um, and so we'll be, I think, towards the end of June-ish timeframe, have a little bit more substance on what this office uh, shall look like, offer that to the board members to get their feedback and to offer some feedback um, opportunities for the, the community to say, hey, yeah, this feels right. This is, feels like what this office should be doing and how it should be focusing its time and effort. So that's that's um, kind of the, the, I think, big picture and where my time is currently focused is, again, really going through the paces of a design process for what an office should and would look like. I would say that we're very privileged to have your support in the, um, the uh, identification need of a, a support position that was just uh, approved by the board. Okay. Um, at this point in time, uh, I couldn't even tell you what the job description looks like. <laughs> I was just, I was meeting with my supervisor, uh, Deputy uh, County Manager Michelle Cowan this afternoon, and, and we were both saying, listen, uh, we need a little bit of time to figure out what this position actually looks like and how it, again, supports the, the value proposition that I think you all seek to have it provide on behalf of the county. So just be aware that, that um, we're, at the same time we're designing an office, we're figuring out what exactly, you know, a staff person in that office, aside from myself, will, will serve um, to, to help us uh, in accomplishing our goals. So just for your awareness, you know, it's on the radar. Uh, we're kind of putting notes on the ground every day, like, okay, this is what the that position will do, as well as kind of what the office uh, should function like. So again, very much appreciate for the advocacy for that position. Also to note that we don't have it quite figured out and put a, a tight bow around what that should look like. So we want to be respectful and responsible about your uh, advocacy and public resources such that we can use that, that position effectively. Um, so that's, that's really kind of where I'm at right now. Uh, happy to answer any questions insofar as that process is concerned, but then beyond that, just open it up to hear from you all, maybe your various priorities or perspectives Again, as part of listening and learning and understanding what the needs are for us to kind of design around, so to speak, um, that would be very helpful to me as I can work through through this process. Uh, Bill, congratulations! Um, I'm super impressed, and um, I just started a new job five weeks ago, and people ask me all sorts of questions, and I don't have any answers. <laughs> Certainly not well informed and good answers. So I'm, I've got a real softball for you. Um, I believe the, the mandate um, uh, is to uh, adopt a, a whole of government, you know, for this position, is to have a whole of government view and, and vision around climate change mm -hmm. for Arlington County. What does that look like? Yeah. Well, it's not so much a softball, but I'll still <laughs> <laughs> I'll hazard a response. I, I want to be, I mean, frankly, number one, um, I don't think it stops it whole of county, I think at the end of the day, this is a whole community, right? Like this is a collective action problem. And so we as a county have a role as an institution and, a, and I would argue a trusted institution and a longstanding leader in this, in the climate action work. I mean, the, the recent uh, re reported um, uh, the Accelerate report that was just published just articulates that, that, that we stand as a leader in Virginia, the region and nationally. That is to say also that when we talk about uh, that's the county's work, we have many really strong institutions in the community. We are universities, we are private enterprise, we are community-based organizations, our foundations, et cetera. So it's working across those organizations. So we do that. And it's not to say we don't work with our partners. I think it's uh, taking that up uh, even further of a notch, so to speak, and, and figuring out how we can leverage their resources, their efforts. Um, I mean, there are incentives that they have uh, as corporations or institutions to invest in climate action on their own behalf. How do we how do we coordinate that? We do that for program development. I think there's a value and a vision that needs to come with that as a, as a community that we can, we can leverage. So that's one. How you do that with the structure, you know, I, 
I have to need to figure all mm -hmm. that out. You know, and that's that's part of a process of engaging with the community and learning priorities, learning kind of the ethos of organizations and institutions to bring that together as, as a common you know way to offer a vision for how that can be done. And that's just you know not one person that's working across the county to articulate that everybody has a relationship with various organizations in different ways and to understand how. CPHD or DHS or our police department have a relationship to these institutions that we can understand how to approach them. So that's, that's one thing. Um, two, again, I think I'm impressed by the level of collaboration amongst agencies in the county. When I was when I was going through my interview process, it was it was um, articulated to me that a value of the county was collaboration uh, amongst amongst uh, agencies. I've, I've, in just a short amount of time, observed that. Um, I think where there's opportunity um, is that there is need for capacity building. And what I mean by that is that uh, while there's really strong partnerships amongst portions of agencies, like, you know, having everybody kind of understand the, the value of climate action as part of the enterprise. Like, this is a, like equity, like, climate is a value that we bring to bear spreading that idea throughout the organization. Now, that's kind of at the qualitative level, at the quantitative or more tactical level is then how do you build that into decision making, right? And, and we've seen very strong uh, examples of that through the county's racial equity work, right? If you go to, and watch any of the budget hearings, you will see that every agency understands that as a value of this organization to address systematic racism. How do we do that? We do that through a budget, and is there ways to replicate in some way, shape, or form. Not exactly, but that process and that approach is part of an enterprise. That's, I think, part of the question that will, so that's part of the whole county and then relating to the whole community perspective as well. You appreciate that. Hi, I'm Kevin Benson. Sorry, I came in late. I've been a member of C2E2 now, since before C2E2. Uh, since, uh, I think, my third year now. Um, I, I wanted this is more a comment, not so much a question. You, you've decided several times now, are the county's leadership on climate change? And, and frankly, from the CTE team that we have pointed out a number of times, well, we actually think the county has been failing in that leadership role and has been uh, resting on its laurels and, and, and looking at past success in leadership as opposed to present tools or tools that could be using in the present to advance climate change uh, um, responses and, 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 uh, and remedies um, better. I mean, we have a lot of tools here, and we have the luxury of a county that's, that's actually very, very wealthy compared to the rest of the country, and with incredible public support in this county for the agenda of addressing climate change. So um, with that luxury, it actually makes sense that Arlington County would be a leader in this area. And that's why it's particularly disappointing to some of us who've been dealing with some of the issues where we think the county has really not taken this leadership role. Transportation electrification has been an area I focus on a lot. I work for an EV company, so I, you know, I, I do this for a living more because it's what I believe in, and not just to make money. But uh, it is something that I know a lot of people in this county believe in, not just those of, the, of, of us with a vested interest. And that we know, at least in that area, there's a lot of things the county could be doing that it hasn't done yet. So um, you, you know, you're you probably familiar with some of the issues we've already raised in the past, but you'll be hearing that from us. We will be challenging the, the just the assumption that R&D County is a leader and it should get credit for that leadership, uh, particularly when we can point to examples where we're actually behind, behind the ball. Um, Jonathan, did you have a question? Or is it a legacy hand? Okay. Legacy hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, had, I wanted to know whether what your kind of thoughts are is um, about opportunities that you're seeing as you've engaged across the community to kind of bring people together on, on climate change and maybe even thinking of where, you know, opportunities that people would obviously see as, you know, getting away from the thinking of all these things as snow pipes. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, certainly I, I have not met with anybody from our uh, say private sector partners 
in those years. So I, I, I can't speak to those sorts of uh, questions or conversations yet. That's one. Um, I, you know, I think I think that there's um, so an example uh, that's currently going on. I think is uh, work with some of our community-based organizations, our LMI community. To, uh, kind of, I think there's a. Dimitri will have to comment on this because I'm not as familiar. But work with like uh, Barcroft and others to communicate kind of not only kind of from an infrastructure perspective, but also education perspective, the merits of electrification of our LMI community and our affordable housing, right? So that, that's just one. I know that's what you've heard already, so then it's not everything redundant there. It's just to say those those opportunities, I think, uh, are available in many you know aspects beyond Barcroft. And there's programs, I believe, that the Air team is currently working on to expand that and go further uh, to many of our affordable housing communities and our just market rate communities. So that's that's one. Two, you know, we we are uh, working with we have six uh, at least six um, uh, institutions of higher learning, right? Number one, who have both people who students and stakeholders that live in the community, but also learn here, right? And we're already starting work with uh, GMU or and longstanding work with GMU, but in other ways. Uh, forthcoming programs. So these are just opportunities that we have to do there. We have, and has gone in the past, we have a really strong arts community. We have a really strong library system. These are all educational venues to, to emphasize how climate action integrates, not just as a, a principle of environmental advocacy or, F, you know, uh, or uh, environmental stewardship, but also as a celebration of the arts, a celebration of education, et cetera. Um, I have not had the opportunity to meet with uh, our Lincoln Public Schools yet, um, but there again, and there's where well, there's already been a historically strong partnership between the county uh, staff and, and APS staff. There's ways to strengthen that for educational opportunities. I mean, so there's a few. Um, our natural resources and, and forestry teams. I was in discussions with them last week about some of their education uh, stewardship outreach that they're currently working on. It's, there are already strong narrative regarding climate action. What are ways that we can bring further conversation to bear? Um, we have had conversations, and as I know Demetri and others have, with regards to our emergency management um, planning and outreach to our uh, business and, and uh, neighborhood communities on emergency management. Here again, articulating where climate intersects with emergency management and all hazards planning, uh, both at the individual and neighborhood and uh, community-based uh, level. So these are all just opportunities. And it's really, I think, it's more, uh, it's part of um, just continual touch points. I mean, it, you just have to continually bring climate back into the conversation at all points in time, that there is a relationship between everything that we do or touch has some climate outcome, positive, negative, or otherwise. And just, you gotta, this is not, um, this work, you know, I, I imagine Demetri would agree, it's not one and done, you're just continually working, you know, it's just persistence, time and persistence is what offers change in this, in this context, in my opinion. I have to keep jumping up to that next level. I, I just want to um, say that I appreciate your statement that um, it goes beyond whole of government and it's really a whole of community. And I want to give a parallel example uh, because we really need the community. Um, a parallel example is Arlington County right now is developing a new mandatory solid waste management plan. It's going to go to launch in 2024. Um, back in 2015, the county passed a zero waste resolution. And finally, we are now developing this new management plan and infusing it with zero waste plans. So as really kind of a newer sort of thing, we're really pushing out, I, I'm on that committee or during that committee, we are leading with an emphasis on um, public education uh, and awareness raising about the need for changing behaviors around consumption and around waste management and around recycling. And so I, I think in this area as well, we need uh, the, the whole community to change behaviors or adopt better behaviors around um, multimodal transportation, about energy use in their homes, um, we have a community energy plan that has a goal of um, being uh, a carbon neutral community by 2050. So that means all of us. It means the development community. I'm really glad you were here to hear the electric 
education discussion because that's that is something that's been really important to us here on this commission. Um, and you know, there, there's numerous ways. So, you know, some may say it goes beyond the bounds of what a county government is supposed to be responsible for, really kind of pushing um, uh, behavior change out there. But I would say, given the climate the climate crisis that we're facing, it's not too far. Um, and we've got a lot of uh, well-meaning, um, as uh, Vince, or I'm not sure who said it, we have uh, people who really want to do the right thing in this community, well-educated people. Um, with just a little nudge, I think people will pick up new behavior. So, so thanks so much, and um, let us know how we can support your work as this commission and what questions you have for us. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I think it, the way I understand the work with the C2E2 is that Historically, I mean, there's just been a strong partnership between county staff, C2E2, and I mean, not always does everybody agree on the on the on the approach or the outcomes, but, but nonetheless, a lot of uh, strong collaboration. Um, you all and your predecessors and many other commissions, and I, and I hope we can all you know can continue that um, moving forward. That's one. Two is that you know the narrative. I think the for many reasons the narrative around climate action maybe is and necessarily um, required to change from one of, kind of, there's a threat, but also the opportunity. And I think, um, you know, I, I, there's been a number of, um, I think that's part of, uh, part of the collective action question is how do you provide um, both opportunity as well as optimism <laughs> around the work we're doing. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and I think, um, I, you know, I think that's part of, uh, our, our, our work together is to change that narrative uh, such that it brings more and more people under the umbrella to work together um, and to understand the need to partner as an individual as an organization you know, to, to move this forward. That's, that's somewhat theoretical and heady, but I think, you know, arguably that's where I think we need to collectively go. And I mean, the, the literature and the Research on communications around climate action would suggest that that's the path forward, right? And so um, that's that's where I hope we collectively can work to change the narrative to one of positive out and hope, and 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 then put that you know into an action format, like we're all doing our work, you know, decarbonizing our own homes, our lifestyles, our choices, our foods uh, choices, transportation, etc., um, to, to work together. I would also say, you know, and we. Working in a very close region, you know, I worked had the opportunity to work across um, jurisdictional lines from Alexander Arlington, to the district, across the Commonwealth, across the United States. And again, this is also one where um, we're not in this alone, and we have opportunity to continue to work together with our partners across the region too. Um, we're all in this together, um, and I think we have to continue to really work in that respect. Uh, so I'm Doug, for those who don't know me, I'm Doug Snow and Boss. I'm new to C2E2 and I'm the chair of the Energy Committee. And Bill, uh, in like the first week after he started, came and talked to the Energy Committee and um, uh, really made a great impression on us. Uh, obviously, very articulate. Um, we gave you a long <laughs> two earfuls. Yeah, I've got, I've got pages buses, and pages in here, right? About the buses, about the buses. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to follow up on that at this time because <laughs> if you want to pick up that grenade I understand it. Um, so here's my direct question if you don't want to answer that's okay but I'm a litigator so I'm going to be direct. Has the county manager given you any face time in the five weeks that you've been on? Oh yeah job? yeah I've met with Mark a few times. Um, I will say that one priority coming out of my conversation with Mark has been really the question around engaging our private sector partners and in our institutions. That is one very clear question he posed to me is how can we bring more of our community organization, you know, community-based organizations and, and partners into this work. I, he was very clear and articulate about that. Um, that's partially why I answered the question about how do we take a whole community approach. Um, and so that's, yeah, I, I think that's, um, that's, that's one. And then um, many others, I mean, the, I would just say the county manager's office and the, um, the organization whole has been very gracious in their time and effort to help me understand everybody's roles, responsibilities. And, and again, it's part of a learning process, but, but 
you know, again, peeling back the onion, but the, the um, willingness to work together has been phenomenal as I look at the upcoming organization. We hope that you'll develop a very close relationship with the yeah. county manager. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I've had the opportunity to meet with all the board members as well. I um, had some time with them a couple weeks ago. Not only uh, got to hear their priorities, share it with all myself and some of the, what I'm hearing uh, from the members of the community. So that was a very uh, great opportunity to, to learn from them, understand their needs, as well as kind of build uh, relationships with board members um, as well, which, which you know, will continue to happen over time. But a you know, relationship isn't built in uh, an hour, it's built over time. I have a kind of a, a broad question. It gets to the narrative and how we think about things. And it's, we're constantly, we seem to be running into a lot of, you know, issues of, you know, what's the better choice for addressing climate change rather than, you know, from my senses, the understanding is it's all of the above and you do whatever you can when you can. Because we're doing, and I think transportation is pretty clear on this one that there's a whole portion of the people that support transportation and see it as, you know, improve multimodal infrastructure, improve public transportation, and that electrification of buses is only is is only a diversion, and that we get much more gains if we can get more people onto transit. And I just rode a bus, and there were six people on it. Um, you know, it's going to take a while to change those behaviors. So why shouldn't we, you know, it's, it's kind of how do you kind of get this message across that we have an opportunity now to do something that makes sense and we shouldn't be deferring it because we think there's something that's going to make even bigger gains because we need all of the gains we can get incrementally as much as we can get it. And I think we actually ran into the same thing, honestly, with the art bus. The maintenance facility is, it was like, oh, let's not worry about the fact that they're putting in all fossil gas systems in the building itself, as opposed to go to all electrification, because we're designing it to handle an all electric fleet. And then, of course, they went and decided they were going to delay that all electric fleet for five years or so. But, but that, that's, it's, it's kind of like those two things aren't an either or, or that this is a good and therefore, we can excuse it's not so perfect. It's kind of, you know, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. And in this, they're, they're using that argument where it doesn't make sense because actually the perfect is everything all at once at one time. So I'm going to, that, that's a very complex question, <laughs> notably. And, and I'll be fair, one, I'm not prepared to answer. Uh, yeah. what, what I what I would exercise is some privilege to mm -hmm. take that as a comment. Yeah. Um, I have yeah. not had the privilege or opportunity to meet with our transportation team, uh, mm -hmm. with Mr. Emanuel, and any sort of, mm -hmm. he and I have had some opportunity to meet, but we haven't had any depth of conversation on that specific question or those mm -hmm. questions. So I, I would prefer not to answer yeah. that because I just don't have, I don't yeah. have the knowledge, right. I don't have yeah. the background. I know it's, um, it's a key interest to this committee amongst many others, um, and I, I just am not, uh, with any depth of knowledge that I can yeah. speak articulately on behalf of the county yeah. about here's what the depth of information or complexity exists. Yeah. So I, Maybe, I apologize, but that's just not something no, I'll put right it now. within the context of this is kind of what we're looking for sure. sure the leadership to do that because you know it, it does come up um, fairly frequently on these things and, and I always like to think about it as how do we move to an improv. Approach. It's always an and, it's not a but or an or. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how do we get those conversations going in that direction? And your position should be one. I would hope that would help help us get to a lot more of those conversations. Rob? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it, it seems that often by the time we, we get a project, whether it's, you know, um, Americana or the art bus, already developed to a point that oh well no we can't really make those kind of major changes because that would be too mm -hmm. time and and uh, money intensive so how do we a get the information out to developers and others so that um, you know they have that information of newer technology and b how do we get in earlier on the conversation so hopefully having your position 
eventually um, enable some of that earlier, as being earlier informed or you know, having the climate be a factor earlier on. And also just from a homeowner's perspective, I'm trying to walk the walk, have the installed gas in our house, no more gas, water heater, no more gas, electric. And I tell you, it is Kafka-esque trying to <laughs> de-connect the gas line, wash the gas through, can't tell you how many times we've spoken to India, and then finally we need a permit from the county to, anyway, it's a saga. <laughs> so, um, and I'm someone who's informed enough to want to even take that step. So how do we get the information out, kind of Carrie's point, to people that this is a step to take, and then here's your guide on how to do it. Yes. <laughs> it, it would be helpful if it were a little easier, both from the developer's point of view, you know, when they don't even know how to do it, because it's new technology to them, and then from the owner's perspective, how do we do it? You know, what the county's doing in terms of stormwater, I think, and accounting for that is awesome to pay forward. And eventually, whether there's some way of accounting for electrification, solar panels, that kind of thing. So glad you're here. <laughs> glad you're here. There's a lot to do. Last <laughs> Sure. Uh, so I just circle back to, to build on Doug's comments. Glad to hear that you met with the um, uh, with the board members, uh, county manager, and just curious. And you know, I don't want to give you a tough question to leave on, so maybe throw it back on the on the mm -hmm. leadership instead of how you might think about you know, measuring success a year from now. Have, have the leadership uh, indicated to you what they might expect to see? That would be attributable to this position versus what might happen, what Demetria and, and the other courts are doing on their own anyway. Have they given you any indi indication of that, or have you thought about it? And if not, you can yeah. punt all together and talk to us about Well, it. so I think, so, so I, I will answer that question. It, it's more coming from a, um, I have articulated this to the county manager and the board members, but it, we haven't codified that this is my measure of success. But, but I would say one is, if I had, um, a measure of success, it would be that at the very middle, I could go to an agency lead, uh, one of our department heads, and say, hey, what are the top three ways that your agency has some relationship to our climate action work? Okay. And 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 that could include, you know, oh yeah, uh, the, the softballs are like DES has a very clear connection, to, you know, DPR, clear connection, but there are many agencies that don't, right? If I could go to our economic development director and him to articulate that, hey, the county has climate action goals. This is the way as I interface with that. I think that that's a, a success in building capacity throughout the organization. Now, that's pretty minimal, I think, in some ways. Not uh, it's simple, but not easy. But I think that's one uh, measure of success that I think is important. Because, you know, much like our, our I come back to our work in racial equity, right? It's to take an organization, Samia Bird, who, serves as our chief race and social equity or race and equity officer she has done, done phenomenal work in bringing this organization forward where there was already strong work in addressing equity but and creating it at an enterprise level and such that everybody recognizes yeah this is an important value that we listen that we as a county organization believe in and so every director can say hey we're investing our time and effort to address inequities in, throughout our community i think that that's a clear parallel here in many ways. I think there's many throughout the community. I'm, I'm impressed by the level of confidence um, throughout the organization that I'm hearing. Uh, it just making sure that's like an enterprise value, I think is one, one piece. Again, not simple uh, or simple, but not easy to do, but uh, a measure of success that I would um, kind of work towards, I think is is, um, is part of my, um, my tenure here, at least in the next year's worth of, of Thank you. And hopefully you can come back in June and July and tell us what you want to do. Yeah, I think um, and I have to, me and I have a lot of coordination work going on, uh, trying to figure out the cadence for, for um, all the meetings, as well as going to all the other commission meetings, right. too. So um, we'll all we work through that, Jen, uh, you and Demetra and I and others. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bill. Yeah.
No, uh, where are we? Dimitri, you were going to, if you can do maybe a fairly brief discussion of the IRR grant. I think everybody hopefully had a chance to read the um, proposal. So maybe just you can book summary and, and then we can talk about, ask any questions. That's great. Um, <clears throat> this was one of the first actual NOFOs that was released uh, out of the IRA. They're, they're slow in coming, but they're starting to pick up a little bit. Um, there was an opportunity we saw for building a really essential toolkit. It's very it's specifically geared towards disadvantaged communities. Um, a lot of those, whether it's an EPA grant, so whether you're using the EPA um, environmental justice screen tool, or whether you're using the CDC or the Virginia Commonwealth Social Vulnerability Index, they really come up with identifying the same general areas. A lot of these are not surprisingly along the pike. And um, uh, some of the criteria and some of the data that our public health division has gathered on the differences between those neighborhoods and indicators, and, you know, with neighborhoods north and North County 2007. One that just jumps out at me, so I'll just mention it right here, is that uh, there are three census tracts in the greater Columbia Pike area where the life expectancy in 22207 is 11 years on average longer um, than those three census tracts. So we wanted to focus in the big picture and the end run on going hopefully after HUD money to do the actual upgrades. But those are buildings that are older. They're generally the victim of deferred maintenance. The indoor air quality is bad, the exterior in, uh, you know, air quality is bad, um, and energy efficiency has not been a priority, either in multifamily buildings or small commercial. So we did an application under this EPA grant that would develop a decision support tool that would model those buildings. What we're looking at is taking, whether it be five or six, we'd like to have not too much granularity but buckets of buildings, categories of buildings that are common by vintage, by composition of construction, et cetera, et cetera. Using that tool to model it, then that's supported by a full financing options portfolio that includes financing options, includes financing mechanisms um, of different natures so that we can also go to those building owners it's very interesting, a lot of the buildings actually along the pike are owned by 12 families. And they've been passed historically down from generation to generation. Well, if you go into Crystal City in those areas, the Clarendon Corridor, those buildings are built and they're generally turned over within seven to eight years. Um, so we have uh, the financing portfolio. We have technical support, live technical support training for contractors. And then we have a very, very rigorous, very specifically geared outreach and education, um, but mainly outreach, really engaging the community on different levels. Our partners are the Northern Virginia Affordable Housing Alliance, the Columbia Pike Organization, George Mason University's Virginia Climate Center, and the Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. Those are the uh, physicians. Um, so we're very excited about that, and we're hoping that we will hear August or September whether or not we're awarded. Uh, it's up to a million dollars. I think all in all, ours came to 983000 and change. Um, but we're hoping that that toolkit is also going to set, oh, I forgot the biggest part. It's hard to do an actual quantitative measurement in the decision support tool for public health just because there hasn't been a really refined, ripened methodology that's accepted nationally for that. But we're also going to build public health impacts into the decision support tool. Um, so we're hoping that that can form the basis and give us a lot of momentum and make our proposals for the HUD money to do the actual construction and upgrades will be more compelling because we've had those tools. So this is essentially a two-part is you develop and engage with the well, it's two parts owners. that we've done because right, this yeah. is an EPA grant, and right. then we're hoping to take the the you know con constellation of tools and assets from that and resources in order to support a very compelling, competitive um, HUD 
right. application. Uh -huh. So you'd have to pay, you'd do the analysis first, identify projects, and then go to HUD or that. Sounds exciting. Yeah. This sounds like something Samia Bird would want to be involved in and champion. Yeah, and um, well, we had, again, a lot of our peers within the county mm -hmm. transportation tipped in and gave us a lot of data. Oh, Public yeah. Health gave yeah. us a lot of data. GIS was there. So um, it was uh, it was a big effort around the clock for yeah. two weeks. But um, that's just the first. And we're also developing between six and eight other grant proposals, either individually or in partnership with other jurisdictions. Um, they're under DOE, they're under EPA, um, roughly it's electric vehicle charging infrastructure, electric vehicle, actual the equipment, the buses, particularly school buses as well, um, because at least they've done a carve out for school buses. Um, exactly, we're looking at um, an urban heat island initiative that oddly enough is titled Safe Streets or Safer <laughs> Streets or something like that. Um, we're also working with NREL right now um, in a focused uh, analysis of our product and those buildings. We do have to be very sensitive in how we share and, and use that information at this given time because our is very large and they're not going to be able to do all the buildings all at one time. And the owner, Jire Lynch, doesn't want us going out and basically saying, oh, we're going to fix these buildings. Look what, look what horrible shape they're in. <laughs> Um, because they're taking on, again, these older buildings um, that are in need. Um, so there's just a lot going on, and lest I forget, there's the CFI, which is corridor electric vehicle charging, as well as community charging. There's two buckets in that. And then, of course, there's the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, and the Pollution Reduction Fund, and we are in active discussion with multiple jurisdictions, definitely Fairfax, possibly Loudoun. Fairfax, as you know, wanted to open a green bank two years ago, but whether it was because of the softness and the commercial real estate and the reduced revenues, or perhaps a host of other you know, factors, they're really looking for opportunities under the IRA to provide the initial capitalization of the fund. Um, but I can tell you right now, Having had the experience with community choice aggregation, green banks, you name it, out in California. This is not just kind of put money in a bank and kind of say, we've got a green bank and you know, build it and they'll come. It has a lot of other components. It needs financing mechanisms and incentives attached to it. It needs administrative money that's carved out because no um, administrator in the green bank industry is going to simply agree to take a fee off each loan. They know that it's too difficult and too slow to generate uptake um, and convert those, uh, those loans. And I am hoping we're talking and we're going to be submitting comments um, up until, let me see, I think the deadline is May 12th. We're probably going to submit the comments the first week, by the end of the first week in May, on what we think the, this should look like. Because the other thing that absolutely, absolutely has to happen is the local governments are going to have to drive the actual uptake and momentum in the program. That is extraordinarily time intensive, resource intensive, and they should typically, when you go out to California, the CPUC energy efficiency programs, a 10% off the top allocated towards administration and up to 15% off the top for what we call NBNO, marketing education and outreach. Otherwise, you're going to have a nice fund that's sitting there with no place to go. So the bar prop, there's money hopefully going in that, that will kind of progress <laughs> even outside of the tool, and that will give you additional experience in terms of building upgrades. NREL was wonderful to work with. Because they really, they had experts that went in there and worked with us, which is fantastic on really looking at different approaches towards upgrading those buildings and making those upgrades work and what you might have thought would be the first thing you might consider doing, but there were other conditions that you wanted to think of. So we're really happy and we're also talking with NREL about this was one of three levels. It's the 
lower level, which is pretty astonishing. Um, that's in return for a lot of work that we did. We gave them a lot of time on surveys and everything else and recommendations a year ago. Um, but there's two other kind of upping the tier and the, the depth of the partnerships that we're looking at. Are you talking about CDC? Hmm? The CDC program? Is that what you're talking about? The, uh, NREL, the uh, Clean Energy Communities? Um, yes. no, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, yes. Okay. It's all sound great. And can I ask you, do we have, sorry, my ignorance on this, there's a, there's a lot of grant opportunities and more coming. We have, does the county have grant proposal writers, consultants, or full time, or like this surge that's coming, are you staffing up to make sure not to miss any opportunities with these, or are uh, you external? I set up task orders with two different consultants around six months ago, maybe longer, eight months ago. Because I knew this was going to happen. I had era still very fresh in my mind where it was like, wait, 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 and then hurry up. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that you, this particular grant was no match required. Mm. Um, but we're obviously going to have matches that are required in a lot of the other ones. So we have to prepare for those. Anybody else got any questions? Okay. So let's. Get into our letters. Hopefully these are both fairly standard letters. Um, I can just identify a few areas. Which one do you want first? Um, yeah, we've got Bingham and RMF. Let's do Bingham first. See that um, again, standard score is about the same as, as what we see for, for most buildings. This one was interesting. I think this is one of the first one I've seen that have gone for 0.35 far. Yeah, I don't know what Amazon did, but well, you know, they were the same. Yeah. Um, so that it's a little different, although it, it doesn't really change much in terms of, of the way we evaluate it because some of the key issues are still kind of pending in terms of especially electrification. So tell me what to scroll. Um, everybody comfortable with the first few paragraphs? Kind of pretty much your standard. Is the second paragraph pretty standard on these kind of letters? Yeah, a lot yeah. of it is, is kind of template-ish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you see anything awkward in the language or unclear, we're always changing them. So, no zero carbon. What I did add in in this actually builds on kind of the experience that. Um, Cindy had, but obviously we can't ask the Building Decarbonization Coalition to come in on every project, but instead added in a sentence suggesting that they really go out and reach out to these experts. I like that. I like that. Um, and, and kind of, you know, put it put it on them as that this is being done, and there's lots of expertise they can tap into. Go ahead. <laughs> Again, the gold, no zero carbon certification for this one. I think we go scroll on. Energy efficiency. Now, they did have a model. Um, the models get really vague, but it did seem to suggest that they could get over 25%. It's always the preliminary model. We're not going to promise anything more than the 20% that we're required to have. And, and, and this was another one where they did do a decarb study, but um, we're now starting to at least see some of the energy models put in options for electrification. So, you know, kind of highlighting that it's like, you know, your, your own energy model indicates that, that you can achieve the full electrification in order to do it. Uh, a little, you know, nicer than that is that they should really pursue that. If there's anything that we Highlight any further on those kind of get. Yeah. Do we have a sense of how realistic it is for them to do that at the late stage that we get the project? It, it makes it more challenging because it is at the late stage on on these. But I think you know there probably are some options there that they. I mean, if they were still considering it. Um, and now they're, they're saying it's like, well, we don't have the space, we don't have, it's the cost issue, but I think with the IRA and there's other issues, but again, 
I'm just going to put on the table yeah. for a discussion another evening that I love the idea um, that Ted, Ted, uh, Ted yeah. raised about possible, and obviously it depends on whether the county thinks this is even possible or appropriate, but having a, uh, a contracted peer review group that could work with developers from the early get-go mm -hmm. and to uh, advise them on designing yeah. right and, and working with a designer to build in the, but anyway, that conversation, I'd love to have that focused um, on it. It gives them cover, it gives them expertise. They yes. don't feel yeah. like, I don't really know what exactly, I'm doing. Exactly, because that's the only way we're really going to get a chance to, I'm kind of sure. to, to build in, because I mean, what we've been saying before is that you have to design these things from from, from the get-go. That's right. You can't just we're decide to, late, you know, 60% like, level. I know I'm trying. Right. <laughs> um, that's why we wanted the six-month training right. period before yeah. the exactly. next one goes forward. Well, that's an excellent yeah. opportunity yeah. to provide training yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that might, maybe that's a standard G, GBI requirement is that, you know, as part of your team, you have somebody that, that knows how to build these things and is working from the beginning um, or however you can structure it. So, um, hold down. Yeah, I mean, I think Ted made a big point about electrification. Um, standard on the, the EV charging. I did add in le later today. Later this afternoon, I decided since they have the 3.5, I should highlight what the three extra point is. And that's the big difference between 0.25 and 0.35 is they have to pick three items from another list. You know, they don't always tell you what those three items are. I have one that it um, okay. didn't tell. In this case, yeah. they did. Yeah. Um, so and it's so just just kind of put that in. Although I had to kind of figure out what they were talking about about renewable energy. Because it was, they, they, they put it in in terms of it's the lead version 4.1 tier 2. Yeah. Um, so I had to go look at the. By renewable. Yeah. Yeah. Quite yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's not. But. Don't you sit in the chair? I, yeah, I think so. I'll double check that, but I think we look for that. I think I updated all those. I mean, that's one of the keys when we keep copying and pasting these I letters. Know. We have to look very carefully and make sure we made all the changes. Yeah. Um, I don't see one. Does anybody have any questions or comments you've suggested? Is this paragraph, is this like suggested or somebody put that in as a the red, to meet? You, you added that later. Right? Yeah, I, I added that. that so just for Versus anybody. four point? Is that, there's supposed to be a decimal point there? I think it's 4.1, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yes. Version 4.1, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I was kind of going back and forth. It's, and it's trying to versus version. Version. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll version check and make sure that um, okay. we got the, that's right. I mean, I always do try to review it for any typos or that. Do we get a motion to approve? I move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody oppose? Okay, let's go on to the next one. I just, I just yeah, Cindy. Yeah, yeah. Can you see the paragraph on Philia? Uh, that I dropped in my letter because it wasn't really pertinent, but people should feel free to include a paragraph on biophilia if it's relevant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I kind of, I actually did add in a little bit more on, on that and some of the other benefits on the, the next one. The biofit, I mean, this this is right in Clarendon, you know, there's just a whole lot there. Yeah. They're, they're putting in a little pocket park, at, you know. Can we turn little, the volume down? Yeah. Uh -oh. be, letter. But actually, while you're bringing up the other, uh, just a couple of observations, and it's actually from the county board's discussion of the ARVA, or the Americana project on the weekend is, the applicants came in, JBG Smith, and said, they said two things which were not right. As, as first is that the climate is still such that we can't do, we can't rely entirely on heat pumps. Yeah, see, that, that was my... That, you know, it, it's that... It's so, education. <laughs> yeah, and, and I... I and it, it's, as I just sent this email out, like, this makes no sense if New York can... <laughs> I, I said well, they, know, I, I, that, they're doing it in May. It's like, yeah, it, and, and what they're talking about is, you know, if the temperature drops before 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 
Yeah. We can yeah. count it in hours, not even days. We'll have them watch the main uh, yeah. session. Yeah, right. And if it's a highly energy efficient building, it shouldn't matter anywhere it's built. So, I mean, I, I think, but, but I think the county board is still kind of nodding and buying it. And the other one is the, well, it's not worth electrifying right now because the grid isn't all that clean anyway, so gas is still cleaner. And again, it's, That's you know, and, and we do address that in the letter as, Letters, as we always say, is once the grid gets cleaner, um, you know, it's it's automatically clean. And, and well, we literally are helping um, native Alaskan communities to install heat pumps. Like, I, I mean, I yeah. th there's just no way, there's no right. way that that it can't be done here in Arlington, Virginia. And, and I think, too, is we may want to start thinking a little bit more about, and I've mentioned this at some SPRC, <coughs> the geothermal um, is, is keeping that, you know, getting getting applicants to think about geothermal as being a, a big boost for, for energy efficiency. And in a lot of these, I mean, some of the original sites that looked at that said, well, we're right over a subway line, we can't do geothermal. Um, well, that was cool. What our presenter was saying is that sector-wide, yeah. city-wide, over the long term, when you're digging up the streets anyway, that's yes. a chance. Yeah. That's that's right. water pipes right. Right. inspiring. Yeah. yeah, and again, they, they do it in New York City, so in Manhattan. So, okay, uh, quickly. And the same place over and over again <laughs> because of the union. Well, they just tore up my street <laughs> because they replaced the gas line. So yes, that was too. the whole year-long project. Um, okay, a little lower yeah. score on this one, um, but basically the same kinds of issues. Um, but so, should we be asking or insisting that um, anytime Washington Gas digs up a, a a street, that they also lay the foundation of their demise? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll for that. Uh, sorry, um, the joke. I know. <laughs> Moving through this a little quickly, we've got time constraints here. Um, again, geothermal, same language in terms of the other institutes. I think you can scroll down unless somebody's got questions. Um, energy efficiency, again, you know, 75 standard. But again, looking at the energy model, they could get 25. I think their energy model was a little bit now, this one was kind of interesting, and I did highlight this because um, just starting to see this is that some of them, usually it's the DOAS system that they're using um, gas boilers. Uh, John, sorry, yeah. in the paragraph above, uh -huh. uh, there's a sentence that doesn't make it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Look down. Sorry, just go down. Okay. There, energy efficiency. Um, this project could, ener could something, energy efficiency. Realized and achieve, and realized. Oh, achieved. Yeah, I think somebody added I, I, and achieved. I, I did edit that. Maybe it was in the other one that I missed it here. Um, on this one, I did highlight the DOAS because they're actually, I mean, they're, they're actually going with a heat pump system, but they're putting in a back, an auxiliary mm -hmm. that's gas powered. Yeah. Um, actually, looking at the Boston Holiday Inn, they're actually going with an electric. Again, you're, this is the auxiliary when the temperature goes to 10 degrees. Right. Um, you know, is it worth? But again, they're going with the gas um, hot water heat as well. So that's. Um, and here, a better option that conventional gas than that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm sure this is. I, I feel like I caught that one too. Yeah. But no. Anyway. You did that for Okay. Yeah. Correct, so maybe this is a, a different uh, version that, that doesn't have my edits. Okay. So yeah. both these letters say uh, in this paragraph, uh, utilize fossil gas ratios working and likely backup generator. Do we say likely because we don't? We know? don't know, but it's almost is almost it certainly to the extent the that they have backup. Plans that were submitted are not. Oh, they don't. None of the plans ever talk specific. about the backup. Yeah. It's just it's standard, and everybody's going to tell you that there's no real ability. And we don't focus too much on the backup generators because that's a fairly small amount right now at this point. We'll, you know, if we get them to electrify the rest of the buildings, we'll then start focusing on, on these. But 
Um, so should we pull up Carrie's version? <laughs> just um, keep editing. Let's just keep editing. We'll, we'll catch the mist. Uh, I'll combine the two versions. Um, oh, the other. OK, this is the, the one paragraph I added in addition, because and we've heard this from other projects, and I wanted the county board and the planning commission to recognize and acknowledge the fact that we're getting all these statements of, well, we put in our little letter and they reject it. And it, it comes in for this, it comes in for EV chargers. So again, it's something, okay, this is an issue. Maybe there's something that the staff can help with, or maybe there, there's, you know, we need to get to the bottom of this. But that had to yeah. that yeah. mm -hmm. load impact was very, far more significant. The, yeah, transportation. Yeah. yeah, So it just you know, so that's different. So if anybody's got any issues or wants, better did they use that to push back on the EV ready portion? Yeah, I think, and that's usually often where where some of it comes in. Yeah, because usually they're they're not really looking that much at the <coughs> electric systems. Is but again, the two combined. So, okay, keep going. Just in the second sentence uh, to start this section, um, baseline design for less uh, better option than conventional. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll fix that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Electric charging. I think that's the standard. Nobody's going above the four to ten, and yet. Uh, Demetrius, right? That's usually where they come in on the load. Um, and then I did add an, another paragraph on other sustainability items. Um, again, they're going with the renewable, some renewable energy. Am I not remembering this correctly? I think it was 15 or 10. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Oh, is that okay? Yeah. Or in, or in the oh. So should I change? Yeah, change it to yeah. 15, yeah. Seems to be kind of standard in what a lot of people are submitting. Well, that's they're required. Yeah. yeah, they're just it's doing the baseline what's the baseline required. Required. Okay. It's the yeah. baseline. It's required. the baseline. I mean, they, they should be doing it. Yeah. yeah. You can drop to zero. Okay. And then we the last one, just again, this has a fairly nice uh, biophilia. Uh, could use probably more canopy trees. Um, always can use more canopy trees. And you know. Uh, Rainwater management. So, Joan, on the on the paragraph which you talked about the, the yeah. pushback about uh, electric capacity, I mean, can we add a statement making the recommendation is to have the building ready so that when capacity becomes available later, like you install a transformer later yeah. uh, to bring more electricity on site, then right, yeah. you can run the electricity through the building because. EV right. ready doesn't mean it needs to have all that current yeah. running through the building, just the infrastructure. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe exactly. okay, let's yeah. send in uh, when we kind of is, is to have it on the EV parking, is EV ready, and then maybe just even if the load capacity is not, it's not yet there. It's not yet there. Yeah, yeah that's good. Oh, yeah. We can talk about this at another time, but I think to some extent we have to be practical that people are not going to undertake this, it's going to be more difficult for them to undertake it once the building is built. Exactly. Yeah, the well, retrofitting yeah. is always a well, visible, we like more expensive. Yeah. Well, and that's mean, what we're you know, saying yeah. is at least put so the conduits in even if they don't have the capacity. So 50% um, are EV after EV ready. Yeah. Just put in a, a phrase of even if the capacity, electric capacity isn't sufficient. Available. Isn't, isn't currently. Available, yeah. Great capacity. Okay. And then just some other stuff. Let's let's drop the rainwater thing. The rainwater gets really hard to figure out whether they're just meeting requirements or not. They often sound really good, but um, because we we actually had a whole bunch of discussions at another project the other night and just being a little picky about the term of art. Do you want to call it rainwater or stormwater? Stormwater. Yeah. No, but I think you should drop that sentence anyway. Because I'm, no. I'm not 100% confident. It shows up in the lead scorecards yeah. as rain 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds impressive, but so we, there's another project that we looked at the other night, and when we asked them specifically, they basically said we're meeting the requirements. So I don't know, yeah. you know. No, when we go in there for, no, with stormwater, they just look at us and say, if it's not required by the wall, we don't want to hear about it. Yeah, okay. So, all right. Um, and the standard 10 paragraph. Any other comments? Good. Questions? Was good. Okay. Did it go? Oh. I move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody disapprove? All right. If you can send those to me, Dimitro. Joan, you're going to get these from Lynch okay. hopefully tomorrow. Okay, because okay. I know you're going out of town. So. Okay. Um, I'll just mention a couple of things really quickly. Is um, I did send around today. There's the historic uh, cultural affairs plan going on. They do mention sustainability. I haven't actually read it in detail, so but I think it would be nice if at least a couple commissioners would look at it. And then just, you know, if there's anything that's worth us saying or recommending any changes to. And again, with all these planning things, feel free to put thing, comments on as an individual basis as well. Um, and then um, the FNRP, the Forestry and Natural Resources Plan, should be out by the end of the month or very, very early May. So um, that will be kind of going around. And so we'll be waiting out on that. Okay, anybody got any other thing that's pressing that we're working on? Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Right. Good night. Thank you. Hi. Good night. Good night. I was just curious if you um, it's funny. It's funny. Good night. Why is that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you'll see this. It's not the beginning. Uh, uh, okay. So, what you see is on just assembly. Oh, okay. 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 But, uh, yeah, yeah, um, uh, Carrie's been working.